<laughs> so uh, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Nyberg. Well, that's a heck of an introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I want to start by thanking uh, everybody for this invitation. Thanks, Jen, for all the work that you did to, to put all this together and make sure I got to the right place at the right time. Um, and I want to just please note, because I know the Army lawyers will be happy if I do it, please note the disclaimer that everything that I say is my opinion alone and does not represent the views of the U.S. Army, the DOD, or anybody in my chain of command. So now that that's done. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about a trip that I took with students to, uh, the trip went to Finland, Poland, and Paris, uh, talking to senior leaders in all three of those countries about the war in Ukraine. And one of the things that uh, struck me immediately as someone trained as an historian is that the language and lexicon that everybody was using when they were referencing these events was not about international theories, it was not about economics, what they were doing was referencing history. So what I want to do is explain a little bit about what that history means for the people that are living, especially in Helsinki and Warsaw. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about what it means for the war in Ukraine now, and what I think it means for our, the United States' position in relation to this uh, unprovoked attack of Putin's on, uh, on Ukraine. The picture that you see here, we managed to, to plan this trip so that we got to Warsaw on the 80th anniversary of the Jewish ghetto uprising against the Nazis in uh, April of 1943. So what you see here are uh, the, the final commemorations of that as they were starting to, to end it, uh, right in front of this uh, monument to the Jewish ghetto uprising. As I'm taking that picture, directly behind me is a museum called Poline. It's the museum of the Jewish experience in Poland over the centuries. So it's kind of the center of the old Jewish district. So that's what I want to do here. But before I do, let me just explain this weird, strange place that I work. Uh, about two hours west of here. Uh, the U.S. Army War College students are lieutenant colonels and colonels, mostly in the U.S. military. Uh, also, we have 77, this year we have 77 international officers uh, with us as well, from, as we say, every country that we're on speaking terms with, or we, have, we send Christmas cards to. Uh, and the goal is that we take students, officers, who have been really good at whatever it is they've done up to that point, armor, infantry, whatever it is, law, whatever it is that they do. The jobs they're going to go on to as very senior leaders, however, require a different kind of education. So the armed services do something that I think is really wonderful and gives these people 11 months to come to Carlisle. They're not deployed. They don't belong to anybody's chain of command. They're just there as students. And they're there to learn leadership, behavioral sciences, international relations, history, defense management, which is basically the economics of how a budget works, uh, all kinds of things like that to prepare them for what they're going to do at the next level. As part of that responsibility, part of the course uh, that they take with us, they all have to take what's called a regional studies class. Essentially, they figure out by that point where they're going next in the world. Very often it's the Pentagon, so it doesn't matter what region they take. Uh, well, sometimes it does. And then they study that region. And then we take about 45 to 50 students, and we take them to the regions themselves. So this year we had a group that went to um, Central Asia, we had a group that went to Latin America, we had a group that went to East Asia, and we had the group that I run, which went to Western Europe. So that, that was the point of this trip. And the way that my colleague Dan and I de designed the trip, we wanted the trip to feature Finland, a country that's coming into NATO. We wanted Poland, a country that deeply relies on NATO for its security. And then we ended in Paris, where the French are members of NATO, but they have defense obligations outside of NATO that are not directly connected to NATO. So we wanted our students to get kind of three different perspectives. So what I want to do is share a few of the insights of what we uh, learned about there, and again, explain a little bit of what it means. And the concept, the intellectual concept that we're dealing with, is something that we've come to call historical mindedness. And what that basically means is that we want our students to be able to understand how an event came to be in the world, how something like the Russian invasion of Ukraine can be possible, how those people on either side of a conflict might understand that event differently because of their own historical experiences, and to use historical understanding to get beyond the immediate news that they're reading. So, that, so in other words, to understand that the war in Ukraine is, by any reckoning, at least decades, if not centuries, in the making. And what strategic insights can we help our students gain from looking as far backward as possible and understanding the kind of intellectual tools that historians use? So to do that, we went to Warsaw. Uh, here we are in front of one of the, the memorials to the Warsaw Rising, which took place in 1944. 
Uh, and here they are in front of probably the, the, the second or third largest of those. There are now 1,800 World War II memorials in Warsaw alone. The old expression, if you don't go, you don't know. So walking around Warsaw now, it's now uh, against city policy to put up another memorial unless at least 25 people were killed on that spot. And if you don't walk around Warsaw and see this with your own eyes, it's impossible to understand what the weight of history means to people who are living in Poland. So that was another reason for choosing Poland. Um, if you see, you'll notice on uh, our students are wearing yellow daffodils on their um, clothes. That's the symbol of the Jewish uprising uh, in 1943. And one of my students did a beautiful uh, video. We gave them the option of writing a paper or doing a short video. Uh, the short video she did um, looked at the, the yellow daffodil and, and comparing it or analogizing it to the yellow sunflower that Ukraine is now using. She did a really beautiful job with that. So the idea was to not only meet with people in these uh, countries, but to actually walk around, to actually talk to people about what history means to them, to look at the buildings, look at the physical infrastructure in these places and how that is organized. So again, this is one of the larger of the World War II memorials in Warsaw. Right behind it is their Supreme Court building. That's the greenish building that you see uh, right behind there. Now, when you talk to Poles, here's what they'll tell you. They will tell you that in the West, in the United States, in France, in Britain, in Canada, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was an event. It was something that happened. The polls will tell you it's a process. It is something that has been going on for decades. It's been going on for centuries. It came as no surprise to anybody in Poland that the Russians grabbed a piece of Ukraine. And they believe that were it not for the fact that they were inside of NATO, the Russians would have already made an attempt to seize part of Poland. So NATO is, again, a critical part of the way that Poland thinks about its defense and the way that it thinks about its infrastructure. But to me, what was interesting is the difference in the way that they were thinking historically. To them, it makes no sense to start this understanding of the Russian invasion of Ukraine with Vladimir Putin. It makes no sense to begin it with the expansion of NATO. It makes no sense to begin it with the end of the Cold War. In their minds, you have to go back to Peter the Great. You have to go back to a Russian sense that this all belongs to us. Right? You have to go back to a Russian sense that the West is out to undermine us, therefore we need to control this territory. Right? So to again, to the Polish way of thinking about this, it's very, very different. And those of you who know Polish history will know that Poland's borders have shifted and Poland has in fact disappeared off the European map from 1794 until the end of World War I. A state called Poland simply didn't exist during that time period. So again, to the Poles, the lesson they have learned is um, that, that A, their country will be divided if it, is not willing, if it cannot protect itself, and B, in actual fact of history, mo in most of Polish history, its allies have not really been there when they needed it. Right? 1939, Britain and France made a security guarantee to Poland. When the shooting started, they said, yeah, that's pretty far away. We can't get there. The Polish assumption is the same thing will happen this time. Britain will not be there, France will not be there, and the state they're most angry at is their neighbor to the West Germany, who they believe has not sufficiently invested in defense, has not sufficiently gotten to the point where they can help. Therefore, NATO as an infrastructure and the United States as an ally is critical to understanding what Poland wants to do. I'll tell, tell this to you again, um, um, not an official statement from the US government. Warsaw, to me, felt like a city mobilizing. There were American, British, Canadian, French officers, Baltic <coughs> officers all over the place. Our hotel was filled with them. Okay. It is a city that is getting ready just in case. Um, again, they assume that uh, the United States is the only state that is both capable and willing to come to Poland's aid if necessary, because Poland is, of course, a NATO ally. I'll explain what Poland is doing in its own defense here in just a bit, which is pretty incredible. There are now 10,000 American military personnel in Poland. The Poles would be perfectly happy to see that number triple, quadruple, whatever you want. They would be perfectly, perfectly happy to have Americans bring their families with them. They would be perfectly happy to see the American presence in Europe, the center of gravity, shift from Germany, where it is now, to Poland. They would be perfectly happy to do that and pay for whatever it is the United States would like to have. Schools, hospitals, you name it. Right? They are willing to do it. Poland's economy is just outside the G20. They are doing very, very well economically. 
and they're perfectly willing to pour a lot of that money into defense, right, for obvious reasons. The other lesson they've learned from Ukraine is once a bit of your country is taken away, you are probably not getting it back. So the plan must be to defend everything right from the start. Right, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. Uh, they are also aware that the Russians have been historically the most feared, uh, most avaricious of its traditional enemies. This is a memorial just outside the old city of Warsaw to the murder of in the Katyn Forest when the Soviets murdered thousands and thousands of Polish officers and intellectuals, claimed that the Nazis did it, and to our shame, in the interest of US-Russian friendship during World War II, we accepted that argument until the early 1950s, even though we knew that it was wrong. So on the left is a marker to Katyn. On the right is this incredible place that my friend Alexandra Ritchie took me to. Alexandra is Canadian, but she lives in Warsaw with her Polish husband. This is a museum where what they did is they dug up the area in the Katyn Forest where all these guys were murdered. This is what was in their pockets, their pen knives, their wedding rings, the keys to their houses. And now they're on display here in Katyn. It's the only thing that's left of these guys. This is part of the Polish memory, that if you let your guard down, if you let the Russians come in, if you don't uh, adequately defend yourself, this is what you're going to face. Uh, how many of you guys have been to Warsaw? Okay, right behind this Katyn Memorial begins the old city of Warsaw. If you're walking through it, you would think, wow, this is beautiful. And it is beautiful in a weird kind of creepy way. Yeah. The reason it's creepy is there was nothing left after 1944. The Germans went through building by building with flamethrowers and demolition crews and destroyed the city. In the 1950s, the Poles rebuilt the old city. So everything you see looks old, but it's all 1950s or more recent. Right? In fact, the city was so badly destroyed that the architects went to the British Museum to look at old paintings of Warsaw so they would know what color the building should be. This is the capital city of Warsaw. Stalin wanted to build a brand new capital city. The Poles insisted, no, we're going to rebuild ours. And those of you who have been to Berlin know, Berlin made the exact opposite choice. Right? Berlin made the decision to build everything brand new. Right? Only now is Berlin starting to put up plaques in front of the new buildings to show what they look like before the war. They're only now starting to do that. Again, I find those architectural choices really, really interesting. Right? The Poles decided they were going to rebuild as if to say you never wiped the side in the first place. And Germany decided to say, year zero, we're starting again. I find those choices really interesting as an historian. So what does it mean? The United States right now spends an enormous amount on defense. We spend about 2.2 to 2.3 to 2.4%, depending on how you do the economics and you do the math. Poland's going to go to 4% of GDP on defense. Germany is at 1.2. A lot of NATO states, all NATO states are supposed to be at 2. That's the minimum. They'll all get there in the next couple of years. But very few are there right now. Poland is going to double that. What are they going to do? An army of 300,000 people. That's a big army. That's a big army by European standards. Right? One discussion we had with Polish officer offline, a former student of mine, I had two, two former Polish students of mine are now generals in their army. And one of them turned to me at dinner and said, if we get the 300,000 men, will you be OK with a Polish officer being Supreme Allied Commander of Europe? A position that has only ever been in America. My answer was, I have no idea. It's not my decision. Uh, they're here by 250 Abrams and 1,000 South Korean K2s. The K2s, my armor guys tell me, is a very, very good tank. The reason to buy it, the reason to go with that one, is the South Koreans will let the Poles build it and the spare parts in Poland. Right? That brings jobs, and that also means they can repair the things and maintain them. Some of you may know this. They've taken in, again, the numbers are up in the air, anywhere from about 800,000 to 1.2 million Ukrainian refugees. And when they show up, they get an ID card that allows them access to the schools, allows them access to health care, allows them access to housing. My friend Alexandra gave her apartment to a Ukrainian family. And she's fortunate enough she has a country house. So she moved back to her country house and gave the, the, the city place. Uh, when I took students there, one of the things we did was to go to the University of Warsaw and meet with some Ukrainian college students who are now studying in Poland. That was a really wonderful discussion, a really wonderful discussion. Again, very little bit about security. Uh, one Polish professor told me, quote, we are already in World War III. You Americans just haven't caught up to that. I'm not there yet in my mindset, but that's certainly what the Poles think. And again, these tensions with Germany. 
The Polish argument to the Germans is, if we're okay with you rearming, you should be okay with you rearming. Right? We need you to be part of this process. And I can talk more about Germany if anybody is interested. Uh, and again, very, very close relations with uh, the United States. Another joke that runs around the Polish military, that's the Polish flag. It is white for the purity of Poland. It is red for the blood shed to defend it. And the blue represents all the countries who have come to help us when we needed it. Right, that's the Polish joke about their flag. Uh, <laughs> but they are quite serious about what they want to do. Okay, this is a strange picture. <laughs> this is a parking lot in Helsinki. This is on the walk from our hotel to the United States Embassy in Helsinki. Why would I take a picture of a parking lot? Well, in 1940, it was a bunker in case the residents of Helsinki had to hide there if the Russians attacked Helsinki. It's now a parking lot, but in creating the parking lot, the owners had to agree that if there's a problem again, it can be reconverted into a shelter. And that means more than hiding under there. It means they have to provide for electricity, they have to provide for heat in the winter, they have to have a certain amount of food and water stocks on hand. They have to be ready to do this on a wide scale across the country. They also took me last October to a place called the Salpa Line, which I think I have a picture of here. I do have a picture of coming up next which was used as a fortified line against the Russians in 1940. It has been owned by the Ministry of Tourism because they were going to turn it into a national park. It's now being transferred back to the Ministry of Defense in case they need to fortify that line again. What Putin wanted, as he described it, was the Finlandization of NATO. In other words, break it up and make those states neutral. Instead, what he got was the NATOization of Finland, and I don't think he's going to like the response. Mm -hmm. He's not going to like the answer. Uh, all facilities in uh, Helsinki, this has been true since the uh, end of World War II, any facility larger than about 10,000 square feet or the metric equivalent must have a plan to have one day, one week, and one month to be able to shelter a certain number of people. They have a plan in place that the entire city of Helsinki can be sheltered. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. It involves government and it involves private industry. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. The owner of that parking lot has to have that plan on file and can be inspected to make sure that, that they can meet it. Right? With support from the government. Obviously, they don't need to keep a month worth of food in there. But they have to have a plan in place. Um, there's the cell phone line. Uh, right there. Oh, sorry, that, there's the... Uh, sorry, the cell phone on the next uh, photograph. Excuse me. Their memory is, of course, of the Winter War where the Finns fought against the Russians in World War II. They did not fight against the Germans. It's actually a very interesting conversation. Many Finns worked with the Germans, worked with the Nazis, against the Russians. And this is something that uh, Finns don't really like to talk about for obvious reasons. right? But historians are starting to force that conversation too. Like we have to accept some of the moral compromises that we made uh, during World War II. But this is, uh, this is the area of Finland in red that they lost to the Russians. And they had the same attitude that the Poles have. If you lose a bit of territory, you ain't getting it back. And this is the Salpa line that I was talking about here. It's a really beautiful place. As you can see, I was there in the fall. The leaves were starting to change. The air was nice and crisp. Really, really lovely place that you can walk through. And at the end of it is when my friend Timo told me, another Army War College graduate, where Timo said, yep, we, the Ministry of Defense, we're getting that back because we may have to defend it again. It's located on strategic high ground with water around it, so you can, obviously tanks can't go through the water, so the military term is you can canalize the enemy's attack and defend in those spaces. So the, the Finnish army is getting it back. Uh, the same thing's happening in Norway above the Arctic Circle, where they had another thing that they gave to the Ministry of Tourism that is now coming back to the military as well. Finland's defense concept, as I said, Finland has undergone a massive transformation. Two years ago, support for Finnish entry into NATO was at about 20%. The last time they did it before NATO membership, it was at 85%. A friend of mine in Finland said, we didn't want it any higher. He said, if it gets higher than that, it looks like North Korea. And it looks like 100% we're encouraging people to do it. 85% is about that, as he put it, is under the North Korea line, which is a phrase I've been using. I love it, right? It's under the North Korea line. Uh, the vote in Parliament was 108, 188 to 8. Okay. The new Finnish defense motto is never again alone. Get into NATO and then you have partners. 
right? The Finns desperately wanted Sweden to come in at the same time. Obviously, they're not there. But there's been this thing called NORDEFCO, Nordic Defense Cooperation Agreement, between all of the Scandinavian and Baltic states. They're going to do one air patrol system. They're going to do one sea patrol system. It's really remarkable what they're going to do. And that will include Sweden. And then that capability will switch over to NATO when Sweden eventually comes in. This integrated network of trust that I talked about, uh, there are 57 critical tasks identified by the Finnish government. Every civilian ministry has responsibility for something. The Ministry of Education has responsibility for teaching Finnish kids how to recognize Russian disinformation on the internet. Mm -hmm. It's a system that would not work here in the United States, in part because trust in government in Finland is enormously high. It's incredibly high. It's not here, as you all well know. Uh, private industry and communities are involved as well. Finland has 5.5 million people. They have 900,000 reservists and a home guard force. They also have 1.2 million saunas, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> when the Finnish army deployed to Afghanistan, it built its sauna before it built its mess hall. That tells you something about the Finns. Uh, they'll get to 2.4% of GDP, and they'll build uh, 60, they're going to buy 64 F-35As, which are an incredibly sophisticated advanced system. The problem Finland has now, as my friend Timo uh, related to me, they don't have enough senior officers to put Finnish liaison officers at all the higher headquarters of NATO because they never, they didn't know they were going to have to do it. So now they're quickly promoting captains to lieutenant colonel. A friend of mine is going to go from lieutenant colonel into a brigadier general's billet so that he can fill that billet. And my friend Timo is hoping to get the Finnish exchange officer at the NATO um, Modernization Command headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia, but he's too junior for it. He's got to wait three years so they can rapidly promote him to get it. He's brilliant. I really hope he gets it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he's uh, ahead of their army at some point. He's, he's really great. Okay, what does this mean for the United States? And then I'll stop and take any questions or thoughts that you have. What does it mean? Um, when I first got to the Army War College and we first started dealing with NATO issues and we first started talking about uh, NATO issues, the, the line in NATO was there was a great divide or great gap. The states in the east, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Lithuania, the message was there's only one thing you've got to worry about and it's Russia. That's the only thing you have to worry about. There's no other threat to your security other than Russia. The answer from Greece, Italy, Portugal, France was, well, no, there's migration coming from Africa, there's climate change, there's this, there's that. There was a big gap between the eastern states and what, the so-called southern states. That gap is gone. That gap is gone. President Macron was just in Eastern Europe, the president of France, and he said something really interesting. When the eastern European states supported the United States invasion of Iraq in 2003, the French president Jacques Chirac said to the eastern European states, you missed an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. Macron went to the East and said, we missed an opportunity to keep our ears open, using the same French verbs. In other words, you were right and we were wrong. Right? There is now no disagreement over the necessity to do this. This is what's called the enhanced forward presence of NATO, where every state takes responsibility. Germany has responsibility in Lithuania. Uh, it is now Canada, but it's going to become Denmark and Latvia. Uh, a, uh, a guy that just graduated from the Army War College in my seminar, in my class, is going to be the chief of staff of this unit. Again, in the Scandinavian system, they're going to double promote him from lieutenant colonel to brigadier general, so we can take that job. My, our officers in the American Army, when they hear that, I can get promoted twice to take the job? <laughs> yes, the answer is they can also demote you twice if the next job that they want you in is... Uh, <coughs> like they move you by billet, not by rank, which is really interesting. Uh, anyway, Germany has responsibility. It'll become, it'll become Denmark here. Britain and Estonia, Canada will take over Slovakia, the United States has Poland. Right? This enhanced forward presence, collective defense. The idea again here is deterrence by denial. Make it so costly for the Russians to attack any NATO state that they don't do it. This is why Ukraine so desperately wants to get into NATO, and this is why I think the United States is, and France and Germany are right to say, let's not do that yet. Because another <coughs> Russian attack on NATO is an attack on the entire alliance. <coughs> Um, second, it means that the United States may well uh, have to be thinking about exactly what those Polish officers were talking about. If the European presence in NATO begins to really grow, it may mean that the command structure, which is based back in Belgium, which has been American for a really long time, we run it, it may come to the point where we have to cede some of that. And I'm not sure the United States is ready to do it, 
I think it's something that we're going to have to uh, get comfortable with here in the future. Uh, I think also it is uh, a memory that we have to think about the Russians, and we have to think about what their memory of all of this is. Uh, I think it's a false narrative. I think it's a terrible narrative. I think it's the wrong narrative. But Putin's memory of this and Russian memory of this is the United States adding these states on their border in order to be a threat to Russia. Right? I think that narrative is false. Right? Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, states like this came into NATO because if they weren't in NATO, they would be back under Russian control by now. And they know it. Right? It's a defensive alliance. It's a defensive deterrent alliance. It is not designed to attack anybody. But we can talk about that a little bit too. Um, what we do at the Army War College is we try again to understand both the history that got us to this point and we try to understand the historical memories of the people that we're going to be dealing with. Both our adversaries, in this case Russia, I can talk more about Russian historical memory if anybody wants, but the historical memory of our allies as well. I think what happened uh, when we brought our students there is that they were able to see with their own eyes how the memory and history of places like Finland, Poland, and in a very different sense France, were affecting the way that their strategists were thinking. Uh, a line I like to use at the War College, I'm hoping to get it to uh, uh, more people to use it than just me, but it's really hard to build good strategy on bad history. And that's what we were trying to prevent in April with this trip. So I'll stop there because I know we're running short of time and make sure we have a little bit of time for Q&A. So anything that I said that you want to push back on or any questions that you have, please fire away. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael, first, the comment made, I believe, by the Polish uh, officers is that we're in World War III and the U.S. just had not direct that. Yeah. What constitutes the World War III for that? In their mind, you're at about 1939. So Russia has attacked Poland um, just as they did in 1939. Now, Germany's kind of weird in this model, right? Uh, and the West is not really responding. So in 1939, the French and the Germans did the, or the French and the British, excuse me, did what they call Sitzkrieg, right? This phony war. They just didn't respond. And the view in Poland is, yes, you're giving a lot of equipment to the Ukrainians, but you're really not responding. You're really not militarizing in the way that we think you ought to be doing it. Again, this is especially the way they're looking at Germany. In this case, Germany is playing the role that France played in 1939, 1940. What the Poles want the Germans to do is either spend part of the enormous German economy on defense and do it right now. The Germans have promised to do this, but they're just not getting there. Or, as my friend Vladek liked to say, um, Vladek's a member of the Polish parliament, he told two senior German politicians, if you don't want to spend the money, just give it to us and we'll spend it. <laughs> Write us the check. We'll build the stuff and we'll hold the line and you guys can stay an unmilitarized state. That's an acceptable outcome for us. Yeah. Right? And I can talk a little more about the complexities in Germany right now. It is a really com complex situation politically in Germany. But that's, that's what they mean by that. Yeah, please. Uh, Go over here. Having spent some time in Berlin when the fall was still up, and having seen the results uh, uh, that affected the Germans, yeah. I'm just wondering what, I, I think I can understand why they don't want to militarize. So I understand why they don't want to militarize either, uh, but I don't want to overstate that because Germany had, a, West Germany had a very large military during the Cold War. It's not like they can't do it, right? One of the problems that Germany has, Germany wants whatever money they spend on defense invested in European defense. They don't want what Poland has done, which is to buy what they call off the shelf, right? Just go to the South Koreans and buy their tanks, or what the Finns have done, and just buy American stuff, right? They want to build a European defense architecture based on European industries. Now, if you're French or German, that makes sense, right? If you're Polish, it makes no sense. And if you're American, you're looking and saying, look, we have an F-35A, it will take you 35 years to build something as good as this. We already have it. Right? So the French and Germans and the British pre-Brexit were trying to build this thing called FCAS, Future Combat Air System. Uh, and the Polish answer is, why would we wait 15 years to see if that works? There's an F-35 that's beautiful being made in the United States right now. So uh, part of it is political, uh, and part of it is the desire of some in the German political system, and they're not the parties you would think they are, uh, who want to invest that defense money not in hard, what we call hard defense, but invested in so-called soft defense, that is, nation building in Africa, climate security, things like that. Whereas the Army, Navy, Air Force in Germany need that money right now. Because there are 25 years of massive underspending on defense that they need to catch up on. Yes? 
So, go fast forward. How does this end? Great. I'm a historian, so I don't have to answer that question. Uh, uh, James Collingwood, a very famous British historian, was asked that same question by Winston Churchill in 1940 or 41. And Collingwood said, I'm an historian. I don't like to leave myself up to any more ridicule than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> Meaning that he knew he was going to get his predictions wrong. <clears throat> My guess is this war in Ukraine drags on a long, long time. In part because as long as it drags on, the West cannot admit Ukraine into NATO. So Putin has an incentive to drag this out for a very, very, very long time. Uh, my colleague Steve Biddle loves to say that every war is ultimately a negotiation. <coughs> that ultimately you have to have, and it can be a violent negotiation done with weapons. It doesn't have to be sitting across the table. Um, and that negotiation is, I don't see where either side has an incentive to give in to the other at this point. So my guess is this goes on for a very long time. But again, I'm an historian. Future's not my job. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that as an observation. But the given is that Putin won't back down. So the given, I think, is that no Russian leader that would reasonably replace him will back down either. So if Putin were to disappear tomorrow, inshallah, as my Arab colleagues say, um, the most likely candidates to replace him think that Putin isn't fighting this war hard enough. So I don't think there's a magic like Putin's gone and we're good. right? So to use the World War I example, when you got rid of Nicholas II, what replaced him was Lenin. So the last thing the United States wants is a failed state in Russia that we then have to take responsibility for. Right? You don't want loose nukes running around. You don't want you know, all of that. So given all that, my guess is this goes on for a very, very long time at, at varying degrees of intensity. Um, Unless and until Putin gets so exacerbated by all of this that he decides to take it to the next level. It's possible. Which is where I think it's going. It's possible. That's certainly another worry, that if you push Putin and back him up enough, he may take the no nukes off the table. See way out. Yeah. So what do you think of uh, the U.S. response before the invasion and the U.S. response since the invasion? So pre -invasion, and what should we do now that we're not doing it? Yeah, so pre-invasion, I think, was absolutely great. Sharing the intel declassifying that intel, letting people in Europe know this is exactly, when you do that, when you say, here's what's going to happen, and then it happens, your credibility, of course, goes way up. <clears throat> Since the invasion, the administration's challenge has been, how do you support Ukraine enough without risking, without risking what we call either vertical or horizontal escalation? So a vertical escalation would be Russia attacks a NATO state in response. Horizontal escalation would be Russia saying, okay, you're going to mess in our backyard, we're going to mess in yours. We're going to give the Venezuelans top tier nuclear te we we weapons technology or Cuba or whatever. Um, what the administration has been trying to do is spread that needle. So I don't think our last dean liked to say uh, problems at the Army War College, the problems we give our students are not problems that get solved, they're problems that get managed. This is a problem that gets managed. And I, 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 whatever your own personal politics are, I think the administration has played its cards pretty well up to this point. Uh, what to do next? Yeah, I mean, it's in America. It's another thing that Germans have been arguing. The people in the German national security sector say the mistake the German government is making, they're saying to the German people, we're supporting the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians deserve it. The critique is what the German government needs to say is, we're supporting the Ukrainian people because it's in our national interest to do so. And that's a discussion I think we need to have. Uh, whether we can have that in an election year coming up, I have no idea. But I think that's a discussion that we need to have. What is our core interest, and what do we do about that? It seems like a steady drip, drip, drip in terms of what support we provide. Yeah. I mean, you, you feel that that's been a good It's problem. a pretty good drip. I mean, it's billions and billions of dollars. Um, what the, 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 what, what you... The strategic term, the political science term, would be es they would call it an escalation ladder. So what you want to do, you want to move up steps on that escalation ladder, knowing that you can manage the step that the Russians are going to are going to match you with, right? And we were talking about this at lunch. The state that I think is actually benefiting the most from this is China, easily. They've got the Americans distracted. They've got the Russians in their pocket, and the Chinese can go into the Middle East. They can go into Africa. They can go into Latin America, knowing that the U.S. is off doing something else. 
So the real challenge when you're in a crisis like this one is to be able to handle both the long term and the short term. We Americans are good at the short term. It's hard for us to do long term, not just because we're short term thinkers, but because our government does things in two year budget cycles. Right? It's difficult to think long term. It's difficult to shift uh, the way that, that we, we might ideally want to do. Uh, again, this is not to be partisan or political in any way, but I think the administration has made choices that are, to my mind, reasonable and rational. That doesn't mean they're without risk, because every decision that you make in a situation like this carries with it significant risk. But I, I think what they've done has been pretty impressive. But can you give us an idea of... I'm in Delaware. Of course I can say What What, 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 what <laughs> Russians total military resources are in relationship to how much they have devoted uh, so I can't, I can't give you that answer. What I can tell you is the people that I know, uh, that in the Europeans that, I, that I've talked to, believe that this is part of the French argument. The argument is that the Russian army is pretty well incapable of doing any major offensive operation for five to seven years. The Air Force, and obviously its nuclear facilities, and its Navy are untouched. So if they're going to make a next move, it's going to come from those instruments. It's going to come from those domains. What the French are saying is, look, the Russian ground force, if it's beaten for the next five to seven years, we have a window. We don't need to panic, and we don't need to rush troops into Poland. We just have to play the next five to seven years better than the Russians do. That answer is not what the Estonians and Lithuanians want to hear. <coughs> but it is what the French believe. We've got five, seven years. We get NATO's house in order. We get the F-35s delivered. We get Sweden in. We do this. Deterrence is back. That, that deterrence gap is closed. Right, that's the French argument. It's also the German argument. To a lesser extent, it's also the British argument. The further east you go in Europe, the less convinced people are by that argument. Again, it, again it's a, not a strategy without risk, but I understand why the French are thinking the way they're thinking. The French, by the way, are going to increase their defense spending by one third, and they're shifting from small operations in Africa to major ground deterrence operations in Eastern Europe again. So it's a major intellectual and financial shift for France. So <clears throat> we talked about soldiers, tanks, planes. Um, I mean, that's we could have had that discussion in the 70s, Yeah. right? You must have an idea of where NATO's view is of cyber warfare. I do. So, um, you know, cross the border and we'll shut down the power grid in Moscow. I do. Oh, what can I say? OK. Um, <laughs> for years, the lead for this has been done in Estonia and Finland. Estonia by, for NATO, Finland for the European Union, where they're really good at it. Uh, my European friends, not attribution, European friends of mine have said they are surprised by how they are looking at Russian cyber the way they're looking at Russian ground operations. They're surprised at how bad it is. Does it mean they won't learn? No. Uh, and in fact, the Finns, the Finns love it because the Finnish language is so absolutely incomprehensible to anybody not Finnish that AI systems can't even replicate it. So it's very easy to detect when something is coming from Russians. It's very, very easy to detect. Uh, it's a little harder for Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians to play this game because they were once part of the Soviet Union. But the Finns gave us a couple of examples where they, the, the Russians would use a verb that was completely inappropriate. And the cyber guys would look at it and just laugh. Like, it, it's, it, it's completely transparent to the, to the Finns. They can see exactly what's going on. Uh, in terms of offensive cyber capabilities, obviously that's something that doesn't get said around a history professor. And if they did, I wouldn't understand it anyway. Uh, but there is some thinking in the open source stuff that part of the reason Russia hasn't gone too far is they know that some of these countries have offensive cyber capabilities of their own. So you've reached a kind of deterrence in that level too. The bigger risk, I think, from Russia is not cyber attacks, but it's misinformation and disinformation, mm -hmm. which the Russians got really, really good at for a while. Um, and in a hyper-partisan atmosphere like ours, we're a very rich target set for them. It's very easy for them to throw something out on the internet Hey, there are bio labs, American bio labs in Ukraine. Uh, I had American friends of mine who bought that hook, line, and sink. Because we're so used to seeing something that agrees, the psychological term is confirmation bias. You already hate person A. This gives you ammunition against person A. So you just accept it. Uh, again, what the Finns and Estonians are doing is starting this with kindergartners and teaching them how to recognize when stuff is coming at them, and teaching them how to be critical thinkers. We're not doing that. And maybe a country as big as ours, we can't do that. But our political division is making it really easy for the Russians to find those 
those spots. So I, again, I don't know about offensive cipher capabilities. Um, and again, if I did know about it, I wouldn't understand it. I can handle my iPhone beyond that. It's, it's not so good. Yeah. One other question. Uh, I recently attended the uh, uh, Air, Sea, and Space Expo in uh, Washington. Yeah. And uh, all the speakers, including the Secretary of the Navy, were all focused on the futuristic war. Yeah, uh, the Artificial intelligence. Yeah. I mean, it, it, all, it literally almost sounds like you're not going to see the infantry anymore. Um, you know, now granted, this was Navy, yeah. Air Force dominant. It was the Navy. But yeah. it, was, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. I'm looking at Arnapolis. Our graduation speaker uh, last Friday at the War College was General Rainey, who is in charge of um, Army Futures Command, which is in Austin, Texas. Really smart decision to put it in a place you don't think of when you think of Army. They put it in Austin. Uh, he, his thing was, here are five things that aren't going to change. His job is futures too. And one of the things he said is this is still going to be a human endeavor. This is still going to be a contest of wills. Right? I mean, all the things that have been true since the time of the ancients is still going to be true. Um, you know, I think a lot of people expected the Russians to use something other than old school World War I, World War II style infantry, and they did not. Why? Because it's a very effective instrument. They now control that ground that they've taken. Uh, you can't do that with cyber, and you can't do it, my, my army friends would be very quick to say, you can't do it with navies or air forces either. Right? In order to conquer ground, you have to be sitting on it. Right? I personally don't see a way in which that goes away. Um, the easy way to get a lot of money out of the Pentagon is to say that you've figured out what the future of war is going to be and convince a bunch of people with stars on their shoulders that you're the only one that's got the right answer. You can get a lot of money doing that. Uh, I think our system has gotten much better at reacting and saying, well, so far, a lot of the future predictions have just been wrong, right? It hasn't been the Jetsons, right? It's different. And part of this is one of the things we do as historians in an environment like the Army War College. The first thing my students will read is Thucydides, the, the his history of the Peloponnesian War 2,300 years ago. And I'll tell them, if a principle in Thucydides is still relevant to your world today, you can count on it being relevant until your career is over. It's probably not changing. The nature of it, the, the, the actual using of it may change. So misinformation is not new. Cyber and you know all AI, that's new. But the fundamental thing that you're trying to accomplish is not new. And so that's what we're trying to tell our students, that the old Mark Twain line, if you want a new idea, open an old book. It's not all going to be technology. Yes, ma'am. I know we're running short on time, but we have time to. Um, yes, ma'am, please. Well, you um, sort of teased us with, you could tell us a whole lot more about the Russian history that we probably don't understand and yeah. appreciate. What What is one such example of something that you find that a lot of Americans really don't get because we don't understand? The that? Russian historical narrative uh, really focuses on three things, and I did write them down to make sure I got this right. <laughs> Uh, the first is that whenever Russia does not have a strong state, it gets exploited. And the example that Putin would give now would be, Black, would be Boris Yeltsin. When someone like Yeltsin is in power, the West exploits it. When you have a strong state, whether that's the Tsar or Stalin or Putin, then you can launch Sputnik, you can beat the Nazis, you can do all kinds of things. So the first thing is that Russia has to have a strong state. Obviously, you can see how that serves his larger agenda as well. Second is that whatever has gone wrong, in the world has gone wrong have gone wrong in Russia, it's because the West has exploited it. Right. So when things go bad, the, the, the risk is outside, it's not inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third one is that, as Putin says all the time, uh, there's no value in a world in which Russia isn't in it. In other words, that Russia has, just like we have a sort of American exceptionalism in our DNA, there is a kind of Russian exceptionalism mm -hmm. that they believe in too. Mm -hmm. So the argument here is if you take those three core principles, a lot of what the Russians were doing in Ukraine makes an historical sense when it made no strategic sense whatsoever. And for those of you who are interested, I, I, it's not me, but I can, I can, yesterday, in yesterday's Washington Post, I, I, I have a book review out of a British academic named Jay McGlynn, and Jay has produced two books talking about this. Uh, and I'm going to meet her in London next week and interview her for a podcast for the Army War College. And she's the real expert. But if you want a quick summary of her two books, it was in yesterday's Washington Post. I see my host is standing up. That means shut up and stop talking. <laughs>